Rob, what's going on, man? Welcome to the Dad Edge. Yeah, thanks for having me, Larry. All right, so before we get started, here's what I need. Are you ready? Uh-oh. All right, I need to know how to replace a toilet, to hang a ceiling fan, change my oil, maybe rotate my tires, something like if you could like, actually, if if I could put you on my speed dial for anything <laughs> and all things needed, like that would be awesome. Can you do that? Sure. Yeah. No. No problem. I got the bandwidth. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So it's good. It's good to have you here. So you are the dad. How do I? I'm so curious. Before we get started, let's have some fun with how you even came up with the concept of dad. How do I? Yeah. Yeah. I thought of it uh, a few years before I actually posted my first video, and uh, I I came up with dad. How do I? Because I pictured one of my kids in the other room yelling, dad, how do I? And then I'd come running and, and fix whatever they had going on. So oh my gosh, dude, that's <laughs> great. That is great. You want to hear something funny? So my wife, I told you before we started jamming today that my, we're, you know, my, we have four boys and, um, we, my wife was like, you know what, you know what? I have an idea. And I was like, well, I'm all ears. Let's hear it. She's like, I want to have a jar. And every time someone starts a sentence with, mom, do you know where my fill in the blank is? Right. Like, or can you help me find blank? Basically like, I don't know where this thing is, but mom probably knows she's like, and we could like put in like so many tokens. Right. And as soon as like I reach a certain amount, like mom goes and gets a massage. Like, and I was like, that is freaking brilliant actually, because we, we joke all the time, man, that every single question in this house usually starts with, Hey mom, Hey mom, like, and we hear it only about 17,000 times a day. Hey mom. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to give a shout out to my wife. She's like that. Man, I'm amazed how she can keep track of where everything is. I'm, I still go to her, honey, you know where, and yeah, yeah. she knows, she she knows most of the time she knows where it's at. So that's great, man. 32 yeah. years of marriage. Yep. We're coming up on, we'll be, it'll be 33 in January. So the years right. skip on by so fast. All right. So let's have some fun with this one. Let's say you had a telephone. Okay. And you were able, it, this was a time traveling telephone. Okay. You were able to call yourself 33 years ago. You get on the phone, you dial it up and it's you 33 years younger, right? Which basically means you're five. And <laughs> uh, no, no, but you, you call yourself up and you're like, listen, Rob, this is, this is me. This is you from the future. All right, you're about ready to celebrate 33 years of marriage, but I'm going to give you some advice that's really going to help you out, my friend. And it's going to help you from face planning and making the mistakes that frustrate you the most. What would you be telling yourself? Well, first I'd say uh, invest in Amazon um, before I, <laughs> <laughs> or Microsoft. Can you, can you call me while you're at it too? Like just <laughs> yeah. add my phone number to that. <laughs> uh I, uh, well, boy, that's so tough. What, what, if I had one thing to say, as far as, uh, you know, don't sweat the, don't sweat the small things. I think, I think when, when you're younger, you tend to maybe, or at least I did tended to over dramatize some things that didn't need to have so much, so much of my attention. Yeah. 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 It's so funny you say that because you know, we have, we have what's called the bigs and the littles. That's what we call the, you know, so 17, 15, and then we have nine and seven. And, um, you know, my 15 year old is notorious, right. For like, you know, my little ones will be acting out and they'll be like, dad, dad, what the heck? Like, and they'll be like, you would have put me in my room, like so much sooner. Right. Or like, if I would have done that, you would have done this and that. And I was like, yeah, but I was more neurotic back then. <laughs> and I was way, I was way more overbearing. Like I, I've realized that like I'm not gonna get caught up in that because in the grand scheme of things, that so much isn't important. Like I'll, I definitely discipline for the important stuff, but this whole thing, like, no, not really anymore. And they kind of like they, they laugh about it, but I think deep down they're like, God, well, it's like we were your training kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm number seven out of eight, and so it what? was like. Like that for you know, I, I always joked that my parents couldn't remember my name by the time they got to me. But I think the older kids they did a great job on the older kids for sure. Um, but I think they were and they used to always tell that to me. Well, when we were younger, we wouldn't get away with that stuff. Yeah, yeah. How old is your oldest sibling? Like ahead of you in age? Yeah, so she's 12 years older than me. 
And then I have a, a sister that's five years younger than me. So there's a 17 year spread between the oldest and youngest. So you're the oldest sibling ahead of you is 12 years. Yeah. So she's, uh, she just, so I'm 59. She just, uh, turned 71. Oh my gosh. So your, your parents had seven children in 12 years. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. So like your mom was like pregnant for like 12 years. Yeah. Jeez. That's, that's, yeah. that's, unreal. yeah, it's a lot of kids. We, uh, and my mom was one of 12. Um, we came from Kansas. Uh, the, the six older kids in my family were all born in Kansas. And I share all that in my book and kind of talk about the background of what led up to my mom and dad splitting up and all that. Uh, but yeah, so my mom was one of 12 and then, yeah, she had six kids <laughs> pretty quickly in Kansas and then moved to New Orleans where I was born. Uh, and then, uh, my dad, I'm a Boeing brat. So my dad worked for Boeing in Wichita. It worked dried up and he had six kids. He had to make a move that was tough on my mom to uproot from all that family and moved us to New Orleans with the space program with Boeing. And so then that's where I was born. Then we moved up to the Seattle area with the, with the 747. And so that's how we ended up up here. Are you guys Catholic? Yeah, I was raised Catholic. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm no longer Catholic, but yeah. I just asked that because like, <laughs> so St. Louis is a kind of a Catholic, like melting pot. And anybody who has a lot of kids like, Oh, you're Catholic. And you know, yeah. so I, that's why I ask. Okay. So one more, just sort of fun question. Before we get started here, you lived in New Orleans for a while. I did, but I can't remember it. I, you know, we got pictures and stuff of me when I was a baby, but no, we okay. went back a few years ago for my sis, my oldest sister, who's 71. So it was 11 years ago. We went back to New Orleans and kind of poked around and got to see where, where I was born and the hospital and all that. That was fun. Okay. And what about, yeah. can't you been back to Kansas? I have I actually just got back from, uh, we were in Topeka because okay. some of my relatives were in Topeka and we were celebrating my cousin's 80th birthday um out there and then we went my wife and I went to Kansas City for uh for a day just to kind of poke around and got to see a little bit of that city all right so I'm gonna I'll give you one more fun question here okay yeah. here it is so you have your choice of either voodoo donuts or New Orleans your best meal you've ever had there or Kansas City barbecue which one are you choosing uh, New Orleans, I'd have okay. to say. Yeah. I mean, we, we, so we did Joe's barbecue, uh, yeah. at, at the original, at the gas station one. Yeah. Um, so we went there and did that. And then we went to Jack, Jack stack. Jack stack. Was, yep. Yeah. So we went there and they were both good, but I've uh, honestly barbecue Dallas, uh, hard eight barbecue in Dallas. I, I haven't found anything. Maybe it just lives on in my mind because it's my first real brisket and it was amazing. And so everything else seems to kind of compare. It's yeah. called hard, hard eight, not heartache, but hard, hard eight. Hard, yeah. Shout out so. to all of our audience in Dallas. Go check that place there. out. Right. Uh, all right. So let, let's just jump right in. You know, you growing up, you are, you said the seventh, correct? Uh huh. Seventh. And then, you know, your mom and dad are together. And then it was right around, you said it was in between 12 and 14, right? That your dad, decided to leave was it 14 yeah it was officially 14 um leading up to that you know this was the 70s and so leading up to that um the older most of the older siblings were kind of out of the house and then there was four of us younger siblings at home um and my dad got custody of us my mom wasn't able to take care of us without getting into all the details but uh so um we would be left for a time I, I wish I could talk more with my siblings about it it's kind of a sensitive subject so haven't really been able to get my head completely around how long the time was but there was a time where my dad got custody of us my mom couldn't take care of us and we were living in the family house and my dad would load us up with groceries and leave for a week at a time and then we would just kind of fend for ourselves throughout the week sometimes I believe it was even two weeks where he'd load us up and then we just kind of <laughs> again it's the 70s so he was able to kind of get away with it um and so that kind of led up to where he finally came home uh, when i was about 14 and a half he came home and said you know i'm done raising kids he'd already kind of checked out mentally by that time and he had met another woman and he said i'm done raising kids either the older kids 
are going to go live with the younger or the younger kids are going to live with the older kids or they're going to foster care. And that, that was pretty painful because I actually heard him say that. Um, and thankfully, my brother, who was 23 at the time, you know, just a young a kid himself, and he was newly married um, to his my brother, Rick, and then his wife, Karen, uh, was 24. And they took me in. I went to live and they were newlyweds. They got married in October. Um, and then I, I moved in with them in January, just a few months after they were newlyweds and they had a it, I've always called it a uh, mobile home but it was really a glorified trailer it was an eight by 35 trailer that we lived in so we're not only are they newlyweds but they've just in, <laughs> taken on a 14 year old boy that's going through puberty and we're in this tight little you know my the, it was a one bedroom walk through to walk through their bedroom to get to the back of the trailer and my brother built a a shelf and put a bed on it. And that was my bedroom, my bedroom, <laughs> which was this tiny little thing at the back of this trailer. Wow. What about, so what about, you said there were four siblings. What happened to the other three? Yeah. My younger sister went to live with my oldest sister. Um, and she was, I think at the time living in South Dakota, I think that's where she ended up. Um, they moved around a lot because her, my oldest sister's husband was a a district forest ranger, so to speak. He does way more than that. I, I don't want to make it seem like he wore a ranger's outfit and <laughs> anything like that. He kind of oversaw different things. But anyway, so they moved around a lot. And I think they were in South Dakota when my sister went to live with them. And then my two older siblings, um, one was a senior, one was a junior. They actually got an apartment and my dad helped to support them in an apartment, which, you know, they, neither of them, they're both well, my oldest brother was already 18, or not oldest brother, but the oldest of those two was 18. The other one was almost, I guess he must have been around 16, turning 17 at that time. Wow, man. Um, and forgive me, I, I know you said that your your dad got custody of you, right? Mm hmm So what what happened with what happened to your mom? Yeah, she um sadly, I think like I shared earlier about the you know, back in Kansas, uh, my mom was one of 12 kids. And I right. think she always envisioned herself uh, raising all of her kids with all of those big families that everybody, you know, everybody that was um, ha grew, grew out of all those kids, too. So it's a big we got a big group back in Wichita, Wellington area. Um, and that unfortunately, my mom got uprooted from that support system took us went to new orleans i don't think my mom ever thought we were going to stay in new orleans she wanted to get back to kansas and then my dad takes us all the way up to seattle you know i don't think she ever settled in she thought we were you know her goal was to get back to kansas and sure. it just never happened and so my mom uh had some mental issues too some anxiety she she struggled with and she she went to a therapist at the time um and the therapist told her, um, Oh, Barbara, just go buy a new hat. You know, that was her, that was the, how bad the therapy was at that time. And so she didn't get the help she needed. And, um, unfortunately I think, uh, she turned, uh, turned to alcohol to try to sedate, um, what she was going through. And so the, yeah, she just wasn't, wasn't able to take care of us. Man. So when was the last time you seen your mom? Yeah, so she she passed away in 80, so quite a while ago, 86, oh, wow. I believe. So she passed away. For, actually, just last year, I was going, I've, I don't know if you ever do this, but you go, okay, my parents were this age when, <laughs> and I'm that age now, you know? So it was recently that I was the age that my mom was when she actually passed away. And do you mind me? So you, 1986, you're 57, is that correct? I'm 59. 59, Okay. So I'm just trying to quickly do the math here. How how old were you when she passed? Yeah, so I was 20, I was 21. Uh, okay. I turned 22 um, that year. She passed away in January of 86 and I, my birthday's in May. And had you had, you had a, a relationship with her or was it just because you were in Seattle and she was not, correct? She was kind of bouncing around. Uh, okay. She ended up, yeah, she ended up being back in the area. But honestly, there's, I have some regrets about um, how I, I treated her. But I, you know, in defense of myself, I, I was just trying to cope, honestly, well, yeah. trying to, yeah, so it, yeah, I, 
I carry some of that guilt around that I feel I could have treated her better. Um, but I also <laughs> was dealing with what happened to my family. And I was carrying around that for a, quite a while and ca carrying around unforgiveness for my dad for a real long time. And you, I want you to rewind the tape a little bit. And by the way, of course you were, I mean, that's, that's, that's really traumatic. I'm curious at 14 and a half years old, that, that is a quite a transitional age. That's a big age. Everybody remembers when they were a freshman in high school, right? We were, and we remember, some of us remember quite a bit of detail, but it wasn't like you were two years old when he left and it's fuzzy and you don't really remember it. I mean, you were like a young man. And looking back on it, you then go move in with your brother. What is going through your head? Yeah, that was tough. I, you know, some of it's vivid and some of it's blurry too. But um, I remember that was tough because I, you know, I felt like I had to live up to some unrealistic expectation of <laughs> I didn't want that to happen again. So I tried to be on my best behavior when I lived with my brother and his his wife because you know it was it was pretty traumatic. So I think I I kind of turned into trying to be perfect and nobody's perfect, and so that's not a not a good way to live especially at that time when you've got hormones going through your body that you didn't have, you know, before at that age, it's such a formative time. And I was, uh, I was five, four at the beginning of my ninth grade year. Um, and I was five eleven by the end of my, <laughs> my ninth grade year. And so I was transitioning with all that stuff. I was kind of a short chubby kid, kind of blossoming and really unsure of myself. I think I was pretty, uh, I had pretty low self-esteem, you know, where I, I think I could cry fairly easy at that time because I was just overly sensitive to, to things. So it was tough. It was a tough age. There's no question about it. That, um, it was hard. And so I, I think yeah, it's interesting as you talk to my different siblings, if, if you, if you were to talk to my different siblings, everybody was at different stages, right? People had already kind of went through that phase where, where I think, like you said, 14 is a, it's a tough age. <laughs> you're questioning yourself and there's so you know junior high is a bit of a war zone where you go because that, that was still junior high for me at the time now it's ninth grade is high school but it was still junior high and it's kind of a free-for-all where everybody picks on everybody's <laughs> shortcomings you know and so it was pretty that was a pretty tough time like i said before we hit record i think you and i were kind of cut from the same cloth because you know my my biological father left when I was 12, but it, I hadn't known him at all through my childhood. I just, we just reconnected when I was 12 and then he left again, but I was, I, I too was overweight, you know, picked on kind of awkward and, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't actually lose weight and grow until I was about a junior. So I, I totally understand that, you know, so what was it like moving in with your older brother? I mean, I know you said, obviously living wise, you know, moving into a, what sounds like a really small place, eight by 35, you know, trailer, but the dynamics, I'm really curious about what was that like for you? It was hard. One thing though, you know, my brother, Rick, um, us younger siblings all always looked up to Rick as a kind of a model. He went into the service and he was kind of a, somebody that we always kind of strive to be. And so honestly, the fact that I got, I got to go live with him was, I, I felt <laughs> pretty um, blessed that I was able to actually live with Rick, uh, you know, but I also did feel the the sense of, well, I'm kind of intruding here. He's a newly, he never, he didn't make me feel that way. I took that upon myself where I felt like, what am I doing here? And they never made me feel that way. Like I said, I think, you know, they, at church, you'd do your Christmas bulletin picture and they would include this you know, they got their married couple on here, my face sticking in with, and I have a picture of that still, but, uh, and I always appreciated when people would write them and actually include me because I already felt awkward that I, why am I living with my brother? I can only imagine, uh, you know, so, okay. I mean, first of all, that's quite a way to grow up and, let me ask you this. When you started having kids, you said your oldest is 30, I'm sorry, 31? 31. Yeah. Christine's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So when, when you start having kids of your own, so here's, here's what I, I noticed, right? And by the way, I know we're going to jump ahead also to forgiveness and not having a victim mindset, which you and I are both in that camp. You know, it's just like, it was what it was. And, you yeah. know, it's forgiven because the only thing that's going to happen is if I hold on to this, it's just going to kill me. Right. But at the same yep. time, one thing I noticed when I was younger, I had my first son when I was 30 and I started to notice that as I was a dad, cause just like you, when you're like, when you said the comment that you did about, well, man, like I was, my mom was this age at the same age I'm at now, like, or whatever we do. Right. Mm -hmm. And there have been times where I've looked back on, you know, things that happened with my own father. Cause I have a relationship now with him to this day. But when I became a father and I'm just like, you just look at your kids and there are some things that bubble to the surface and you're like, you get sad, angry, and you're just like, cause they're, they're just to kind of give you a glimpse of this. So like my, um, my mom and biological father were married and then they had me and then they only were together, I think for maybe nine months after I was born, but they were married total of four years. And then I had no clue who he was, uh, reconnected with him when I was 12 by accident, but it did happen. We had a very short six month relationship and then he left again and he was trying to start his life over again. You know, he was remarried at the time, had two year old son, another one on the way. And he just, I, I don't th I think he was just quite frankly, really overwhelmed by everything, but we met again and we've had a relationship now for 18 years. And my 15 year old last Christmas, before we went over there to celebrate Christmas. And he's one of those kids that, you know, I think every family kind of has a kid who takes in everything hears all, sees all, you know, but doesn't really call attention to a whole lot unless he's got something really on his mind. And that's the way my son is. And we're getting ready to leave for Christmas next year. And he's just like, can I ask you something? And he never even says that unless something's really important. And I'm like, yeah, of course. And he goes, so we're going to your dad's house today. Right. And we go, we see them often. We've got a good relationship with them. I'm like, yeah. He goes, do you like going over there? And I just kind of like smiled at him. I was like, yeah, I do. I was like, why do you ask? You know, I'm just like, I know that this is going somewhere. And he's like, he just like takes this deep breath. And like I said, he doesn't waste his time or his energy saying something he doesn't mean or saying something that isn't truly intentional. Like he just doesn't waste his breath on that. And he's like, I don't know. And I go, what are you, what are you struggling with? Tell me. And he goes, I don't know. He's like, I've just been thinking about it. And he goes, if you did that to me, I would never forgive you ever. And I'm like, what do you mean? What part? And he's like, if you, if you left my life, like I would be so angry with you. In fact, if I saw you on the street and you left me, I would probably beat you up and you probably could. He's really big. And I, I just kind of like laughed and I said, that's understandable. And I go, and quite honestly, man, I was in that camp for a long time. I was like, but you know, what's really cool. He's like, what's that? I was like, forgiveness. He's like, I don't understand that dad. He's like that. There's no way that's unforgivable. And I was like, I, under, I totally understand where you're coming from. I was like, but you know who I feel sorry for? I feel sorry for my dad. And he's like, why? And I'm painting my, my dad in a picture of being a bad guy. He's not, he just made bad decisions. And yeah. my son and him have a great relationship. And he's like, you know, why would you forgive him? And I was like, because it's a waste of time and energy not to. I was like, I can either be in this camp of victimhood and point the finger and be angry and hold a grudge. I was like, Mason, that's like, if you haven't heard this quote, it's like drinking poison and I hope that he dies. I was like, the only person that that burdens is me. I was like, but you know who really has to live with all this is my dad. I was like, God, every time he sees me, there's probably a part of him that even though he loves me and we hang out and he loves being with the family, that that's a strong reminder of what didn't happen right? And decisions that were made that he's not proud of. I was like, I'm not going down that road and I'm not living that way, but I understand where you're at. And you could tell it just, you know, he's a teenager, but you could mm -hmm. tell it just wasn't getting through, but that's okay. Like uh, it, that's, that's a, more conversations for a later date. But going back to the question, when you start having kids early on, cause this is what bubbled up for me is like, I got, I had seasons where I was angry. Cause I would like, look at this kid and I'm like, dude, like what the heck was he thinking? Right. I love this kid so much. I'd go to the end of the earth for this kid. Like how in the world do you leave? Like weird. 
But I'm curious for you, did it bubble up when you became a father? Yeah, one one a couple of things actually you just said. I, I don't want to paint my dad in a bad light too. He's he was yeah. a great guy, you know. I mean, yeah. he's a he was he wasn't like this nutty person you'd run into on the street and go, oh, he's obviously a horrible guy. He he was a nice guy and dressed nice. He had a great job. He was uh he was and he, he did really well with my older siblings. Unfortunately, he just didn't finish that well and then we you know i ended up forgiving him and um i forgave him without him asking for forgiveness because if you're waiting for that person to ask they may never ask or they might not even feel like they need that <laughs> need forgiveness and so i think it's important to understand that you need to forgive prior to to waiting for them to to ask for forgiveness and the quote you used about um drinking poison that was a eye opener for me and i share that in my book that that was like, wow, that is what I'm doing. I'm drinking poison and hoping it somehow is hurting my dad. And he, I think he's kind of moved on, <laughs> you know, he's, I, as far as I can tell, he doesn't seem like it's really affecting him, but it's killing me. And I've talked about that a lot on my different channels about expending energy to keep those plates spinning of unforgiveness. You know, it, it takes energy to keep that plate spin. <laughs> you know, I got to keep that spinning. Well, man, you could redirect that energy towards something positive and really make something out of your life. And so I would say with my, with my own kids, I, and I've shared this before too, I think when I was 14, as best as a 14 year old could do, um, I vowed that if I ever got the opportunity, I would be the best dad that I, I could be. Uh, and I'm not going to sit here and act like I was always, always the greatest dad, you know, always did everything exactly right. Cause I was learning uh, myself, you know, and doing the best I could. But that was ultimately the goal was for my wife and I, you know, I married well and our, my goal for where our goal was to raise good adults. I didn't want to raise good kids because <laughs> ultimately I don't want them living in my basement. You know, as much as I love them, what's best for them is to be equipped to be able to survive on their own, you know, and my kids, my daughter, our daughter, when she moved, um, she got married fairly young, got married at 21, moved to Tennessee. And that was painful. That was hard. I was in a lot of tears, but it's like, you need to do this. This is good for you guys to go have your own little um, life together um, outside of, uh, you know, in-laws watching over, <laughs> watching over you, you guys get to go kind of go out there and thrive and survive, you know, survive and thrive. And, you know, she has since come back. She's in the area again, her and her husband. Um, and then same thing with my, our son, you know, he, he's out in Virginia and that was hard. It's hard to see your son move across the country and he loves it over there and he's thriving over there, but you know, I miss him. <laughs> so, so we talk pretty much, you know, several, several times a week, um, but it's it's hard once you you know once you equip them be careful because <laughs> they might move away yeah man yeah i hear you uh so let let's uh let's move into this if you could give yourself fatherly advice so you have the same phone right you can but you call yourself you know 30 something years ago before you had your first daughter what would you tell yourself to equip yourself Ah, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, I, th I think that would be difficult. I think, uh, you know, um, maybe to forgive yourself a little bit too, because you're not going to do things perfectly, but you ultimately your aim is to do what's best for your, what's best for your kids. I think, you know, one thing that, and I've tried to share this with a lot of my friends that have younger kids, I think there's such an emphasis on sports um, in our society, which I think sports is a, is a good thing. It can be um, beneficial, teaches you discipline. There's a lot of good things, but it can also take over your life. <laughs> so, and uh, I wished, you know, that I had a dad that I could kind of say, Hey, I feel like this is going in a bad way. Is it, a, you know, what, what do we do instead? You, you kind of, I, I felt like we kind of got put in a vice where with my son, where he's good at sports, good at baseball. And pretty soon you're, running on all these tournaments and all that stuff. And ultimately he's not a baseball player, <laughs> you know, he's a software developer. Um, so trying to keep the right perspective on things I think would be, would have been helpful to my younger self that, Hey, you know, some of this stuff it's good, but don't let it overtake your life because it can, if you're not careful. 
Well, dude, you just you just completely pummeled the uh, all the expectations that every parent out there is going to have a professional athlete. Like, don't you know that that's where <laughs> dude, we we've got this guy, man. Um, and trust me, I used to be this guy to some degree. You know, like where you're coaching from the stands, and uh, you know, I I don't I'm quiet in the stands. You know, all the all the people I've interviewed that are more like you know the psychology of youth athletes. You know, it's basically just shut up in the stands, especially let the coaches do their job, even if you don't agree. And then, you know, anything that you want to give them feedback on, do it in private, do it very gently. Right. And, you know, try to use edifying words, but also work with them on opportunities, you know, make it fun, all that good stuff. You know, we had this one guy, man, and we're talking like learn to play flag football, not even flag football, like learn to play flag football. Like these nine-year-old kids are just learning how to throw the ball. They're learning how to catch. They're learning handoffs and a pass. And that's it. They don't even play games. Like they're just, horse around with these coaches and dude there's one dad that like literally like the i kid you not rob the last practice that we had this dad goes out on the field and is coaching from the field not we're we're not even sitting on the bench anymore the guy's out there with these and i'm like and these coaches are looking at him like we're gonna kill you like and this this poor kid like he's barking orders man yelling at him it was crazy, but, but yeah, I hear you on that one. All it's right, so hard. It is. Well, real, real quick on that, too. Yeah. Uh, so you know, there's, there was my son plays with some great athletes, too, and some of them went on. They're still playing in the minor league uh, leagues. And uh, yet my son is at Amazon Web Services, AWS, as a software developer, uh, doing great. You know, his 401k is growing because he's investing and all this. And these guys are still stuck in the minor leagues making 20, you know, you hear about how much, how much they make in the minor leagues. They don't make anything, you know, 20 or 30 K my son's 10 years, almost 10 years removed from high school and killing it. And, you know, these people are still trying to follow that dream of hopes that someday, you know, someday it might pay off. Well, what point do you finally go? Okay. This kind of served its purpose. I I gotta, I gotta get on with my life. Maybe when you're 35 living in your parents' basement. Like you're saying, <laughs> maybe that's that it. Might be, maybe that's a wake up call. Yeah. All right. So, well, thank you for opening up your past and and sharing with us what you did. And I, I can, I mean, listen, like I said, you and I are really cut from the same cloth. And, you know, so I, I want to get into the creation of Dad, How Do I? And I believe this started in 2020, correct? It did. Yeah. It was April yeah. of 2020. I actually started the channel April 1st. I was still trying to figure out YouTube, you know, so April 1st, 2020. So oddly enough, it's a, uh, or ironically enough, it was April fool's day that I, and then I, uh, when I started the channel and then I uploaded my first video, April 2nd, um, and that was how to tie a tie. And then I did how to shave. And then I, I thought I was going to have this tight community of 30 or 40 people that I would just, and I would respond to all the comments and try to help you know, this core group of people that needed some help. And um, yeah, that, <laughs> that was not to be, it didn't take very long before it went viral uh, near the end of May. So about, I only had uh, six or eight videos, I think at, at the time. And um, yeah, it's, and it resonated. I think a lot of it was the pandemic too, you know, what everybody was kind of isolated and uh, looking for, I think maybe just to hear from a, a normal dad, uh, that and to maybe calm people that, you know, we're all going to be okay. Eventually we'll get through this. Uh, and so, you know, there's people that watch me tie a tie and are cry- are crying from that. I, that didn't, I didn't expect that. I thought, you know, in my ignorance, I thought people were, I was just showing people how to tie a tie, but it was resonating on a level that, that I never imagined. Well, you know, you, you have the, I obviously I've only known you for, you know, a few minutes longer than what we've been recording for, but I, you know, you've got this certain sense about you that's very in, like comforting and almost inviting. Like uh, you're someone who's just very understanding. Like I just get this vibe from you that it's like, Hey, come on in. You can tell me anything. Like it's not going to knock me off my horse. Right. And, but I, I don't know if people have told you that in the past or not. I've kind of heard it, not necessarily those, that was very well put. And thank you. That's, that's very kind of you. I try to be, I try not to get too overly (laughs) up and too overly down. I, you know, I, I've been in, I was in sales prior to this and same boy, if you, 
if you go on the sales roller coaster and you're riding your highs and you know wallowing your lows you'll be a wreck and so i you know like i shared with you before my faith is huge because i just feel like you know what uh, i'm here temporarily it'll be fine i'll get through this and and we'll be good cuz yeah if you don't boy woohoo the <laughs> look at this new account i got oh no look at this account i just lost you know you're you would be and, oh, yeah. and i think it's not a good example for your kids too so i think you have to over time get better and better at you know what um we're gonna be okay we'll, yeah. we'll get through this well the interesting thing is you know i i'm not surprised like some of these these very what, what you would deem you know pretty basic things like how to tie a tie or how to do this or how to do that but you got to think about how many people are walking the earth with stories that are kind of similar to us where, where there's that father wound or that father void where they wish they would have had a man teach them that kind of thing. And my wife, like she really views it as there's a trait about me that she views very endearing. And she, she's like, Oh my gosh, like when I see this happen, I just love you even more. And that is there are certain moments <clears throat> <laughs> as a dad, sorry, like just thinking about them, like I can understand why your channel just how to tie a tie would get where it would get that type of response. So like my, my kids, um, for homecoming, and this was, uh, last year when they both went to homecoming for the first time, my two older ones, cause my older one didn't go to homecoming his first year, but they went the second and my 15 year old he was going to freshman homecoming and I had taught my older one how to tie a tie early on, like really early on. But my, my uh, younger guy wanted a bow tie. So he came in the bathroom and he's like, dad, can you tie this for me or teach me how to tie this? And you know, when you've had those voids in your life and when they come up now, right? Because I was like, I remember being around this age and wishing I would have had somebody teach me how to tie a tie. And my wife like took this several photos because she knew like right when he walked in the bathroom, he's like, dad, can you teach me how to tie a tie? And she's like, I could tell by the look on your face. It like just really hit you. And she took all these photos and I'm like tying his tie. And I like help him with his jacket and I straighten it up and his collar and all that. And, and then he uh, turns around and he's like, he goes, do you have tears in your eyes? And even as I tell the story, kind of a little bit. And I was like, I do. And he's like, why? And I was like, this, to be honest, man, it's, this is a very big moment for you. And be quite honest, like it's, a, it's, I'm just so honored that number one, you asked me, but number one, that I get to do this with you. Like, I can't even tell you like how meaningful it is for me. And he gave me like this big hug and my wife got a photo of that. But like, I can totally understand why videos like that, as simple as they may be, would go viral because you look at that and you're like, man, like, that's cool. And I could, and like I said, the whole persona that you have, that very inviting persona of like, hey, let me just teach you this, right? Is just really, really cool. And I can, I can definitely understand why you've gotten that feedback, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's very kind of you. I, again, I, I don't know I, I, what I, tr what I've, the vision that I had for it was that I would be, it would be like, I was talking to my own, yeah, my own. And this is what, you know, if you need, and it's interesting because I, I still get comments, you know, and I had a comment this weekend on my shaving video about, you know, there's a thousand shaving videos out there, but I felt like you actually cared while you were and that's I was it. like, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, big that's it. I, th I think that, I think that is exactly what it is. Like just that persona that you give, which is really cool. Uh, so you launch, you know, eight videos, it goes viral in May. You know, what's going through your mind? I was terrified. Uh, honestly, Larry, I, uh, I'm an, I'm an introvert. I, you know, even though I was in sales, I, you know, I, I became a master at avoiding public speaking. So I, you know, I, <laughs> any opportunity, I pretty much said, no, I'll find somebody else. Um, I finally, 
uh, started pushing myself because I felt like the Lord wouldn't want me to be like that. Like I felt like I had something to share and I needed to just get past this trauma, I think, from when I was young that I kept carrying into the future of I didn't feel like I had something valuable to say. And so it it terrified me to um, at, because suddenly my face was everywhere. You know, if you Google Internet dad, it's me, it's my face. And I that I was like, I, I don't think I can put the toothpaste back in the tube at this point. What do I do? I have to kind of learn to live with this and figure it out. And so that was scary. I, and I've shared that I I was crying. I was on my bed crying, going, Lord, what <laughs> what just happened to my life? I don't know if this is what I want, as long as I feel like I'm doing what he would have me to do. I can, I can rest in that. I feel like, but um, yeah, so it was terrifying. I'm not, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't do it to switch careers. I didn't do it to do anything other than just trying to pass along some things. A lot of things I learned the hard way. And, and I was trying to pass along nuggets where try not to waste your time. You know, you go, I, I would go to YouTube and I got to figure this out in my car. I can't figure it out. Go to YouTube. And it's a 20 minute video. And it's like, why did you wait till minute 18 to tell me <laughs> that's what, I, that's the part I needed or what have you. And so I thought I was going to make these videos shorter to try to get those nuggets out as soon as I possibly could. Of course, you know, that isn't always easy. Sometimes you, it does take longer to to build a bench, so to speak. I don't want to leave out parts. And, you know, I, I joke about that on the DIY channel. You see, okay, we're going to put up a wall here. Okay, the wall's up. Uh, wait, <laughs> how did you put the wall up? You know, you, I can't, I, I need the information to to figure that out if I'm going to kind of try to do what, you, what you're doing. And they leave a lot of that stuff out. So I do try to include that. I also try to include uh failures so where i did something it's like i whoops i <laughs> i you know this isn't working quite right so you're gonna have to pivot and do something a little bit different because i think that that's part of life you know i think a lot of times those diy shows are so polished that they they leave out some of the struggles that diy if you especially if you're, you know if you're not an electrician and you're not doing it every day you're gonna go how do I do the skin? <laughs> you know, and oh, as you do it, you're, oh, that's right. That's I, that should. Oh, that's right. I should do this. Uh oh, I got zapped. You know, there's little things like that that I think are are good to include so that people don't think that you have it all together because ultimately none of none of us do. Oh, I agree, man. And you're no longer in sales, right? This is your full time gig. Yeah, I so I'm 59. Like I said, uh, 59, about 59 and a half now. Um, yeah, so the end of last year, uh, I, I I walked away from my job. I just couldn't do it all anymore. I had too many, and I was traveling for for dad. How do I being invited to these different things? And I just, it was just, I, I needed the bandwidth in my brain to be able to to do um, stuff. And I'm still struggle. I don't know how I did it. I kept, I kept the other jo job for a long time. Cause I was, I, one of the things I, and I shared this on my channel is trying to set an example for people that, you know, if something looks amazing, you, you gotta be careful, <laughs> you know, choose your steps wisely. Don't just run after that. I can't give up my 30 year career to chase after this thing that might go away tomorrow, but you know, it just continues to grow. My numbers, my subscribers just continue to grow. And on all channels too, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, YouTube, they're all, all the numbers are on an upward trend. That's really so finally, awesome, man. Finally That's really, yeah. Here. You know, if, if we could switch gears uh, just for a moment again, like, and go back to the forgiveness piece, you're cool with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many of us are, you know, we're harboring and it could be our parents, it could be somebody. And I think we're in a society, quite frankly, that um, there's a lot of victims out there. Right. And uh, I, I was telling you, I just read Gary John Bishop's latest book called Grow Up, you know, become the parent that you wish you would have had, or I, I think that's the subtitle, but he talks about blame and he really unpacks what blame is and blame. What it really does for someone who's a victim is it actually makes them feel safe. It's like a coping mechanism, right? It's his fault. It's this fault. I'm this way because of that, right? Because it can't be about ownership, right? It can't be about us. It's got to be about somebody else, right? But in a victim's mindset, that makes total sense. It, it really does. And I lived in that camp for a long time. I think a lot of people live in that camp for a long time. Some people never get out of it. 
right? But once you really understand blame for what it is, like, wait a second, this was something that quite frankly, a lever I was using to live this safer perception of what happened and how I'm dealing with it. But for you, when it came to forgiveness, if you could, <laughs> dad, how do I, right? Dad, <laughs> how do I forgive? What do you advise? What advice do you have? Yeah, I, 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 what, it's a tough one. Forgiveness is tough. I, you know, I, I never want to try to act like, oh, just forgive them. You know, just forgive them and move on. Yeah, I didn't like that. It wasn't like that for me. I, I had to, I, I sure again, I got to give some credit to my brother, Rick. I would talk to him on the phone a lot. Um, and I, I called it coughing up hairballs um, because I was, I would end up sobbing, you know, I'd be talking to him and then I'm like, I just, I can't get there. Um, I, you know, somehow wanted my dad to pay for what he did. Um, but what I try to share with people is there's freedom for you on the other side of forgiveness. It's, it isn't, it, it's no longer, it was no longer about my dad. It was about me and understanding that. And once I, it, is that, that's why I try to share it so much. Cause boy, there's, it's freedom. It's like, whoa, the shackles are off. Now I can go do whatever I want instead of living with this cloud of, I can't do this because I, you know, I, it, this is why that, you know, I've got that, I've got that in my past. I got that in my past. I can't, you know, and boy, if you can just, if I can encourage people to pursue forgiveness, I'm not going to act like it's an overnight thing because it, it wasn't for me. And I, I would say on my channel too, I, if you spend any time on my channel, people will, it's amazing what they'll share the comments and stuff. And some people have been through way worse than I have. So I don't want to sit here and act like, you couldn't have done any, had, had anything worse happen to you than what I've had. Cause I, mine was tough. People have been through worse stuff than I have, and, but people have been through a lot less than I have. And we kind of live in this uh, society where it's a little bit of a victimhood where, Oh, you know, that's why, that's why I can't do this. That's why I can't do this. Ah, come on, you know, get over yourself. I, my, uh, my uncle, um, his plane went down in world war two um and he ended up living his life with hooks and scars all over his face and but he never ever made you feel sorry for him you would walk in the room and he'd be you you would just see past all that because he didn't he didn't wallow in the corner feeling sorry for himself he you know just made the best of the situation that he had and so for me if i <laughs> You know, if you ever look at somebody and go, that's a person that should feel sorry for themselves, man, he didn't. And so I've got no excuse to feel sorry for myself um, when I, when I look at my uncle Bud. You said hooks? Yeah, he had hooks for hands. Um, oh, okay, I got it. He had arms. And so he would use hooks. Uh, yeah, he had hooks and he was a POW um, wow. during the war because he went down and the Germans, um, you know, it was a POW camp for for nine months, I think. And then he was able to, able to come home. So he's since passed, but he was always such a, an amazing example of overcoming, you know, again, way worse than I, anything I ever went through. Wow, man. Yeah. You know, and so I think a really solid message, right. Would be forgiveness could actually be for you, right. If, if you're really thinking about it, it could really be something that's freeing for the individual who's holding it. Yeah, I, I've experienced that now. It took me a while to get there too, and but I, I'm there now. Uh, but that's that's really great advice, you know, because I think we, the way I think a lot of us view forgiveness is, well, if I do it, then I'm letting that person off the hook, right? And what they did was okay, and that that isn't what forgiveness is all about. Um, Absolutely, and I've had, yeah. you know, I was on a, I was on a local talk show where I was actually in person. Um, and that I brought it up and that was one of the responses was, you know, I don't believe in letting go and living and live and let live or something like that. And I was like, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to say that, <laughs> you know, right. I think, you know, I'm just saying it's in your own best interest to, to forgive. Yeah. I agree with you a hundred percent. In fact, I just think it's such a, such a waste of time. And and you mentioned the word energy earlier, cause there, there's that piece too. The, you know, the, the, one of the last things I really want to talk to you about is, you know, the stereotypical 
dad out there, like Al Bundy, Homer Simpson, Peter Griffin, you know, all these, all these dads that are putting this light of like, well, they don't know anything. And there's movies too, like that. And that, that, that just like, I just shake my head at that because that I really think dads are a, are a big target for, you know, guys looking like morons. Right. And even if you look at like, they, they always make guys like the single guy, right. In movies and sitcoms and that kind of thing. Like if you look at like Ryan Gosling, right. If, if you look at like crazy, stupid love, that movie, he's a single guy and he's got all of his stuff together. Right. And he's, you know, very confident, put together everything, but it's the married guy, the married dad that, you know, is played by um, Steve Carell. That's a complete, you know, he's, he's aloof. Right. But uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, if I can do anything with my channel to move the needle on that, I would love to. And I try to on any podcast and any time I'm interviewed, I try to build dads up because there's a lot of good dads out there. And I, I think what concerns me when we're when we're or when dads are portrayed in this lack of respect light, I think sadly i think some dads live up to it where it's like well that's what's expected of me so here i am, here well, I am. You know, it's not funny it's not it's funny not. we need you we need you to be on point and leading your family you know um and i think you see it in our society where you know that guys just it's it's okay it's it's it's, a, it's what's expected of me i'll just bail on this marriage or i'll bail on the kids or i'll because that's what people are expecting me to do. So I'll just do it, man, hang in there. We need you. There's ripple effects when you make the decisions to, you know, <laughs> to bail or, or what, what have you. So anyway, if I could, I mean, if I could move the needle, even one degree towards that, being a dad is a cool thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're a good dad. Uh, it's, it's such an honor and it's such a window of opportunity to, pour into the next generation and it's over in the blink of an eye, you know, like we said, my daughter's 31, my son's 28. It's like, wow, that was, I, you know, it's, it gets crazy at times. You were you with four kids. I mean, we just had two, you're probably running every which way, but loose at times, but you know what, that, that won't, that's not going to be like that forever. And you're going to long for those days where that's right. I remember when we were running here and running there trying to do all the things because then it's quiet and it's like, woo, what? <laughs> now what? I got to <laughs> so. be honest. I got to be honest. I'm not, I'm not looking forward to that. Like at all. Like, uh, yeah, I think about, you know, my, my oldest is just about one year away from going to college. And he's like, what are you going to do when I go to college? I was like, I won't be able to talk for about 48 hours at least <laughs> i was like i'm gonna be a mess man and when your younger brother goes i'm gonna be more of a mess when your third brother goes more of a mess and when the final one goes i'm gonna be like holy crap like what what i mean you know a lot of people were you know they, they'll ask like dude like what's it like raising four boys and i joke about it all the time i'm like just imagine you're at a fraternity party and everybody's drunk and nobody wants to sleep and you never get to leave that's what my house is like i was like i was like honestly it's busy it's crazy i was like there are seasons where all four boys are in certain activities. I got one kid in band over here, one kid football over here, another one soccer over here. And this one's starting basketball and I'm coaching this team over there. I was like, but you know what? I love it. Like, to be honest, if whenever I have a moment to just step back and decompress for a second, I'm like, this does not feel right. Like I almost, I embrace the busyness. I embrace the chaos. I love the loud noise. Sometimes it's annoying, but most of the time I really love the loud noises. Right. And the crazy stuff like right now, I went downstairs and it literally looked like the Tasmanian devil went through our basement. Like there are toys everywhere. There's laundry everywhere. That's where kind of like the boys congregate down there. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, look at this. But I stepped back and I had one good, he, he was actually, he's actually a client, but really good perspective. And I think you'll appreciate this is shoes. I had one client tell me shoes. I was like, what shoes? What does shoes mean? He's like, shoes. Shoes will always remind you to appreciate what you have under your house. And I'm like, okay, I'm still lost. What are you talking about? He's, and he kind of like laughed and he's like, well, I guarantee you trip on a lot of shoes in your house. I'm like, they're everywhere. He's like, yeah. He goes, and so did I. He goes, and I had a good friend tell me what I'm about to tell you. And that's this. Shoes. 
when you see the size 12s that your 17 year old is in, and then you see the little size sevens over here that your that your seven year old's in, he's like, you realize that that 17 year old in the size 12s used to be in this little guy's shoes right here. And this little guy's shoes sooner or later, blink of an eye is going to be over here. He's like, shoes always remind you where you're at in the stage of these dad things. And when you look at them, instead of getting upset or annoyed that they're there, remember, oh, wow, they're still here and I still have time. And here's what stage they're at. And I know they're going to be at that stage before too long. And that was just really revealing to me. Like when he said that, and I was just like, man, that's so like, I, I appreciate the chaos. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself when these kids move out. It's going to be really, I'm not going to lie. It's going to be very hard. Yeah. 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 It's it was hard. Yeah, I love that about the shoes. I hadn't heard that before, but I like it. Um, I, uh, I've shared this before and I share it in my book. I, I was, a, you know, I mean, everybody goes through, through a midlife crisis to some, you know, some respect, but I, uh, my goal after my dad left was I wanted to raise good adults, you know, so I married well, raised good adults. And then it was like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm still a young man. Now what? And I actually prayed about that. I'm like, Lord, I, I'm still got a lot of life to live and my, we, we kind of did it and our kids are out of the house and they're thriving. Now what? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to buy a bigger house. I didn't need a fancy car. I didn't need any of that. And so I was like, now what? And, and I shared that uh, in my book too, about when we went over to, we went to, visited Italy and you go to Italy went to Rome and you know, there's a lot of ancient history over there. You go to America and you know, the history's not that old, but you go over to Europe and spend any time over there. And it's like, these, there's these, you know, Rome was the, the center of the known world at the time. And now there's a lot of ruins, you know, it's just, Oh, this guy, a statue of that guy, statue of this guy, broken statue of that guy, you know, what's the legacy there? I, I don't know. And I guess it really stuck with me. I'm like, you know, what's my legacy? What, you know, hopefully I can touch, um, some lives. And then here, here we are today. This is, it's been crazy. Uh, you know, I, I just trying to, yeah, be, do what I can with the platform that I've been given um, to the best of my ability. I'm certainly not perfect. And so whatever I can do though, to help, if I help one person, then that's, that's worth it. That's really cool, man. Uh, what What's next for you? What are you working on next? Yeah. Uh, I got some cool things. Uh, got some good sponsors, thankfully um, that, help underwrite things which is <laughs> essential it's great so firestone has been a great partner of mine and they i honestly feel like they get what i'm trying to do more so than sell firestone tires you know or firestone complete auto care they, they they've asked so little of me and yet i f honestly feel like they just want to get behind something that um is is good you know is doing something good so there's uh yeah different opportunities that i can't really speak about yeah. but they, they they just continue to um i feel like are, are heading it in the right direction where i think ultimately but you know i've tried to i get i get offers for sponsorships on a daily basis from <laughs> just such a vast array of companies and i have to weed through those and go ah, i can't do that i i don't feel um there's a company that wants me to promote their razor and i've cut my nose on <laughs> the blade underneath it uh that you cut if you shave underneath your nose you know how they have that blade on the back of the razor yeah yeah you end up cutting my nose with their razor and that and bleeds like, like a stuck pig too right there oh, it sucks yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know gillette um is one of my there's not a sponsor but their the razor i've used for years i don't necessarily i'm not gonna you know anyway it's, yeah. it's hard because i want to again i want to i i if it fits and it makes sense and it's something I would recommend to my own kids, I think I can feel and sleep good at night knowing that this is something I'd share with my own kids. I feel okay sharing it with my audience. Yeah. Same, same. I mean, over the years we've gotten just bombarded with people that companies that want to sponsor us, you know, jeans and, you know, prescription off-brand Viagra that we delivered to your home discreetly and all this other stuff that and we turn down. I mean, we only have, four different partners and we embrace and love them because they align with our core values. And I think audiences, I think really need to know that because I think there are influencers out there that try to do like more of the cash grab. We're not one of them, you know, the same sponsors that I've had for 
Uh, one of them has been a year old and then the other ones have been four years running. And, you know, we, you know, we, we don't, we don't really take on any more than that unless it's something really, really profound that we know will impact somebody's life for good. Otherwise mm -hmm. we just steer clear of those, but that's really cool. Uh, I want to make sure that the guys can find you if they want to subscribe to your YouTube channel go out and buy your book, um, or just connect with you in general. What, what's the best way to find you and, um, where do they go? Yeah, I have a website, but it's kind of under construction. I've kind of gone away from it just because I've had so many other plates that I'm spinning. So you can find me at uh, on YouTube at Dad How Do I, and you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Dad How Do I, and then on TikTok I'm at uh, the real Dad How Do I because people were pretending to be me because um, I, I was that. slow to get onto TikTok. I was slow to get onto TikTok because just because I that's a whole nother podcast, but I'm just concerned about the short attention span and what's happening to our younger generation um, of swipe, 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 you know? Um, but anyway, so I'm on uh, there and then you can find my book uh, Barnes and Noble. A lot of times Barnes and Noble will have one or two copies in stock actually at the physical Barnes and Noble. So when I was in Kansas city, I signed the one copy they had while I, while I was the there. Got me. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you can find it on Amazon as well. Dad, how do I? Awesome. Well, guys, we'll not not to worry. We'll have all the links in the show notes uh, for Rob. If you want to connect with him, head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday 131 for this show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash Friday 131 for this show. And happy Thanksgiving, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy. Rob, thank you so much for coming on today, man. This was uh this was so much fun. And uh I feel like you and I are cut from the same cloth, like almost very similar paths, and you know, both past and present. So I wish you the best of luck, man. I love where your heart's at and I love where you're going and uh, anything we can do at Data Edge, you know, to support you. Uh, we're here to support you as well. Well, thanks, Larry. Yeah, I think you're doing a lot of the same stuff that uh, I'm hoping to do as well. Um, yeah. And I, we each can, can contribute and understand how cool it is to be a dad and support dads. I think that's, that's huge. So, 100%. and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. That's right. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care.